So um, our next speaker is uh, Gordon Wisman, he, who is an assistant professor at Stanford. And he is also the co-founder of uh, two startups like Zin Labs and Vaxon INC. And prior to joining Stanford in 2014, Professor Wisman was also a research scientist at MIT. Yeah, so um, today I will just uh, sh share his pre-recorded video. Let me see if you can share the screen on that. Hi, I'm Gordon Wettstein, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about neural scene representations and rendering. Scene representations are something that most of us are working with on a daily basis, whether it's in robotics, graphics, physics simulation, autonomous driving, or 3D computer vision. All of these use their own handcrafted scene representations that are perfectly adjusted and engineered to serve any one of these purposes. But the thing is, uh, handcrafted scene representations don't generalize well across these applications, and they're also limited in way, the way they can be trained or or developed in the first place. So neural scene representations, uh, which are basically learned representations that are differentiable, can really overcome some of these long-standing challenges in graphics and many other uh, application areas. Neural scene representations allow us to learn data that uh, include priors across scenes that we can use to solve inverse problems that are ill-posed. Uh, it allows us to represent multimodal properties of a scene, which can be important, for example, when not a human looks at them, but when a robot has to make a decision. Uh, and it can be useful for learning properties that are simply difficult uh, to explicitly model. So there are many benefits of thinking about neural scene representations, and I hope I convince you of many of those in the rest of this talk. Uh, but one big question is, well, where, where, where does this representation actually come from? Uh, and in the context of AI, we typically then think about how to train them. And so, you know, what is the data that we have that is widely available already today? Well, it is 2D images, <clears throat> whether they're computer generated or whether they're photographs of real scenes, we have an abundance of images in, online and in various databases. And so why don't we start with those because they're already there. Well, then a very high level general pipeline for a neural scene representation and rendering framework would be to somehow extract meaningful information from these images, distill those into a differentiable representation or a neural scene representation that typically uses abstract features with an inductive bias to be 3D also. And then we need a neural renderer on top of that that takes our scene representation and somehow renders it or projects it into the 2D images. Uh, so neural rendering techniques uh, are basically just differentiable versions of uh, sphere tracing, ray tracing, rasterization, or any other uh, rendering technique that, that you may know, depending on what the representation is that uh, is underlying them. So the output of the neural renderer would be uh, 2D images again, and we can basically try to re-render the images that, that we gave as input to our neural scene representation uh, and apply some kind of an image-based loss on those uh, to train the system end to end. So this is what's called a self-supervised scene representation learning approach because you don't need any manual input or uh, annotations from a human to train this. You just need the images and send it through your pipeline uh, and make sure that the pipeline outputs whatever you put in. And uh, that's a very intuitive uh, framework that way. Now, how do we think about a representation? What's a representation? Well, there are different types of representations and we typically have seen a lot of explicit representations like voxel grids, uh, point clouds, triangle meshes. These are what we're working with in graphics most of the time. And those are great, but they're not necessarily the best when you try to represent a scene. So over the last, I would say few years, uh, specifically in 2018, uh, there were a couple of proposals in computer vision uh, thinking about modeling 3D objects as neural networks specifically um, coordinate networks or scene representation networks. So in this context, we have a neural network modeling the scene or a visual scene, for example, that take as input 
a coordinate, so for example, the X and Y position uh, of, of the 3D space, and they model uh, quantities like the color, uh, the semantics, the shape, or whatever else uh, on, on the specific uh, coordinate. So this is actually a continuous representation of a 3D scene that is parameterized by a fully connected neural network. Uh, and although the concept was introduced in the deep SDF paper and also occupancy networks in 2018, um, our work in 2019 was the first to leverage uh, such a continuous rep neural network parameterized representation using 2D supervision by including a neural rendering algorithm. So uh, let me show you how this works. I mean, we're gonna follow our general pipeline that we just saw starting with multiple posed observations of a 3D scene, such as an, a car here. We're then gonna model this scene representation network, um, which maps again, 3D coordinate to quantity of interest, for example, a feature vector. And then uh, we put a neural renderer on top of this. And in our context, we used a ray marcher uh, that basically marches along the rays through the volume and accumulates the features in the volume. Uh, and that, that helps us uh, render a 3D image by concatenating and aggregating those features. And we can then compare the rendered images to the observations uh, with some loss function, for example, L2 or L1 loss. And we can thereby train both parameters of the representation and maybe any free parameters of the renderer if there are any. Now, one thing that, this seems pretty simple, you know, we can overfit this to one scene, but you know, one idea behind this neural scene representation is that we can do more than traditional handcrafted representations by generalizing across classes of object. So for example, if we look at multiple different cars, then each of the cars is different and we could fit a neural network separately to each of these cars, uh, but there's probably some redundancy because all of these cars have common uh, features like four wheels, mostly uh, a chassis and a couple of other things. So what we can do and what we did in our SRN uh, paper in 2019 was to use this manifold assumption from uh, machine learning, which basically states that, you know, even though you need L parameters to parameterize every little object, if you have a class of objects, they can oftentimes be represented by a much lower dimensional subspace as basically lying on a k-dimensional manifold. And this can be enforced by uh, modeling each of these objects using latent code vectors of size k. Uh, so these embeddings, uh, zi here, and each of the cars is then uniquely represented by these code vectors. Uh, you know, now the question is, how do you map the code vector to the actual car? Well, we used an idea that is known as hypernetworks. A hypernetwork is a neural network that predicts the parameters of another network. So this hypernetwork would take as input the code vector of a specific car and then output all the weights and bias values of the network representing any one specific car or that specific car. Now we can train this using uh, multi-view images of many different cars. And in that context, we basically optimize code vectors for each of the target cars, for each of the training cars. Uh, and a single shared hyper network. So the entire class of objects is fully defined by a single network and these code vectors. So that's a very powerful idea because the hyper network really learns a very strong prior uh, that is uh, generalizing across these cars. And you know the way we set up our scene representation networks makes it include an inductive bias that makes it inherently three-dimensional because they take 3D coordinates as input and output some feature representation at that location. So using this idea uh, and this generalization idea in particular is powerful because now once trained on a specific class of objects, we can now take individual images of objects. So just a single 2D image and predict the full 3D shape of these objects. And so you can see that most network architectures that existed up until then are basically simply not view consistent. They in include a lot of uh, uh, artifacts because they don't have the strong 3D inductive bias or they don't have the right neural rendering technique. But our combination of you know, scene representation, network representation and, and neural rendering allowed us to get pretty good results 
that extrapolate the single view into 3D and that are pretty view consistent. So we did this for many different types of objects like cars and chairs. Here you can always see on the left the uh, normal map, uh, the, the synthesized view from a single input image, and then the ground truth video as well. So this works really well for these shape net objects and uh, combined really neural scene representation, generalization ideas, and also rendering. So all of this was before NERF. Uh, NERF came along in 2020, uh, early 2020. And I think one of the many big benefits and uh, contributions of NERF was that uh, we were able to achieve this photorealism. So we were able to you know, move from modeling these shape net objects to modeling photorealistic scenes, and that's great. But NERF is limited in overfitting to a single scene. There's no notion of generalization in there, which I just showed you. So that's kind of a slightly different tangent. And NERF opened up uh, a, a, a toolbox of, uh, of different ideas that have been coming out and been published in. Um, computer graphics and computer vision since then. And one of the fundamental questions that our group has been uh, focused on is to think about how to design the neural network architectures uh, for these types of neural scene representations. And you can think about this as a, as a, in a broader context, let's say, uh, by thinking about the types of signals they represent as something a little bit more generic. For example, these signals could be images, they could be 3D shapes, they could be 1D waveforms for audio or, or other applications. And today we mainly built on uh, discrete signal representations. For example, images are typically represented by 2D grids of pixels. 3D shapes are typically represented by 3D point clouds or vertices and meshes. Audio signals are represented by discrete 1D waveforms. It, it, those tools work really well, but you know they have limitations. Uh, this idea of you know, representing a signal using a neural network is powerful. And as I mentioned, this came up in uh, 2018 from, was proposed by several groups simultaneously. Uh, and typically what people had been using were these multi-layer perceptrons that again, take as input a 3D coordinate, for example, for 3D shape and then output uh, either whether that, that specific coordinate is inside the object or outside or on the surface, or, or it can also, uh, represent the, the distance to the closest point on the surface. That would be a signed or unsigned distance function. So uh, it's just a fundamentally different representation. And again, one benefit is being able to generalize across objects as I've already shown you. Uh, one limitation of these MLPs though, is that uh, they're not very expressive, okay? So what that means is that a traditional representation like meshes and voxels are limited in memory. You can only store so much in memory before you kind of run out of that. Uh, you don't have that problem necessarily, at least for these uh, neural network based representations, but the network has to be a reasonable size. Uh, and so then the whole uh, uh, representation is limited by the capacity of the network because the capacity defines what the fidelity is and the level of detail that you can actually represent. And it just turns out that ReLU activation functions that most people are using uh, simply don't have a very high capacity. So we've been exploring uh, other ideas. Uh, and one simple idea was to use a periodic activation function uh, in, in a network architecture that we called sinusoidal representation networks or sirens. So this idea of a siren was introduced in uh, at NeurIPS last year. And we demonstrated that very compact networks can represent very complicated signals really well. And these include uh, 2D images, 3D shapes, 1D waveforms of audio, uh, and also uh, wave fields used for physical simulations. So let me try to convince you of this uh, by showing you a, a first example. Uh, this is going to be an easy example where our input is a 2D domain uh, in X and Y. We uh, want to fit an image, but we don't show the network the image itself. We're showing it only the gradient of the image. So we're training the network network rep representation on the gradient of the image. This is basically the Poisson equation. And uh, again, uh, here I'm comparing a couple of different uh, nonlinear activation functions. And it turns out that uh, these sirens that I mentioned uh, are really great at fitting not only the, the gradient of the signal that it's supervised on, but also the, also the image itself, 
the second derivative really well, really fast also, as you hopefully saw in these convergence plots here. Uh, uh, this, this is just such a great tool. Being able to fit not only the signal, but also the gradients was really important for many applications in you know, uh, computational geometry and beyond. In this context, for example, when fitting 3D shapes uh, to uh, point clouds, we want to place constraints on the surface normals or maybe on the sine distance function, like the iconal constraint, they all involve mixtures of gradients of the, of the representation and the representation itself. So it's actually really important for the representation to have well-behaved gradients. Um, and as you can see here, uh, our sirens can represent this complicated tie statue really well with a lot of detail, whereas a comparable RELU network is simply not able to capture that amount of detail simply because it doesn't have the capacity. Uh, here's a room size scene. Again, on the left, we see a RELU network representing a 3D shape supervised on point clouds and looks fine, but uh, you know it's very limited in the amount of detail, whereas the siren representation you can see here actually results in fine detail across this relatively large scale scene. And this is a single global network representing the entire scene all at once. Uh, one aspect that I just want to briefly mention is that if you can model the signal and its gradient well, then this also works great for solving physics-based simulation problems. So for example, here we're solving the Helmholtz equation on a complex value field that is constrained by uh, the initial condition only, and immediately the siren fits these signals, whereas other representations like using ReLU or the hyperbolic tangent, the people have actually worked on for a while in, in physics-based simulation, uh, just don't work very well. And so these sirens are really nice. Uh, and so far I've shown you that they can overfit to individual signals like images or 3D shapes, uh, but I haven't shown you yet that they can actually generalize across scenes. Uh, and you know, generalizing is an interesting topic for multiple different applications. And one of those applications are generative adversarial networks, so GANs. So one popular data set, for example, for GANs is CELEP A. Uh, it's a collection of 2D images showing the headshots of uh, celebrities and 2D GANs then basically learn a prior across this space and are able to generate new faces. So we uh, took on the challenge of trying to make that work in 3D using a what architecture that we call PyGAN. It basically uses a siren backbone architecture to represent these 3D scenes. We train it only using 2D face images. And the thing is, we, we don't have multi-view supervision. It's only supervised on individual images on of individual people. Uh, our neural rendering technique is a neural volume rendering uh, that, that is very similar to that of NERF. You basically step along the ray and accumulate um, the features along those rays to project a 3D representation into a 2D image. Uh, what was really new was this, um, this backbone that's using sirens uh, instead of the ReLU architectures. And then we came up with a new way to generalize across uh, uh, different uh, objects using a mapping network that's pretty standard for GANs, but in particular, how we concatenate the mapping network into this backbone. And we used feature-wise linear transforms. So that's basically a multiplicative concatenation where we predict multiplicative weights that are acting on these nonlinear activation functions here. And that just works really well. Um, I wouldn't say we're quite there to get photorealistic high quality results, but we certainly made a big step over some of the recent work that's inspired our work. For example, Hologan and Graph were the first works in that general space, uh, but they, 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 they're, they're suffering from lots of artifacts that we were able to mitigate with our architecture quite a bit. Now, all of these techniques like NERF, also PyGAN and others uh, built on neural volume rendering and neural volume rendering is very slow. So that is a big problem. Um, neural volume rendering works by defining a camera, shooting rays through the scene. And then for every of these rays, you're calculating integrals. We sample across, basically along the ray to approximate the integral underneath. And it's simply slow because you have to take many samples. And for every sample, you have to evaluate if the full scene representation network. So a full forward pass through the network is required for every sample. And so we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to come up with better integration schemes? From machine learning, we know that 
you know, automatic differentiation is, is such a powerful tool that helps us train all of our neural networks and pretty much everything in AI. And it's all based on the chain rule for differentiation uh, that we all learned in high school. Well, isn't there something equivalent for integration? And as seen by this little cartoon from XKCD, uh, you know, integration is actually a lot harder. There's not this one uh, chain rule equivalent that you can use. It's actually very difficult to come up with like an automatic way of calculating these integrals. And for that reason, most people today in most applications use either Riemann sums, quadrature rules, or simply Monte Carlo sampling to approximate integrals. But again, for all of these applications, you have to query the network many times and that's really the bottleneck. So we wanted to think about a better and maybe fundamentally faster way to evaluate these integrals. And our idea goes back to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which basically says that, you know, if you have an indefinite integral of a, of a function psi, uh, that's represented by the antiderivative phi. And then you can calculate uh, definite integrals using the Newton-Leibniz formula uh, by evaluating the antiderivatives at these two points uh, of the boundary and just calculating the difference. So couldn't we just use that idea somehow? Uh, to make it more efficient. And indeed we can. And we came up with what I thought was a really clever idea that uh, my team came up with. Uh, in particular, we use a multi-layer perceptron, like a representation network for the integral network, for the antiderivative in this case. It turns out we can analytically calculate what the derivative of this network is. Uh, and the, the key here is that the parameters of these two networks are shared, uh, but the architecture itself is different. So this grad network can now be trained to match whatever signal you want. Once it's trained, we can then rearrange its parameters into the integral network because they share the parameters. Uh, and we can now evaluate the antiderivative with just two function calls. So that's such a great idea. Well. The problem for, for neural rendering, for neural volume rendering, is that there's really a, several nested integrals. So it's turn, turned out not to be quite as straightforward. Uh, we were able to uh, speed up the rendering by a factor of uh, eight or so, uh, depending on you know, some of the parameters that you set. Uh, but we did have to take a small hit in the, in the, in the quality of the rendering. But the idea of you know, accelerating integration and developing uh, neural network architectures for fastly, uh, for quickly computing integrals is, is, is really powerful and interesting. So I encourage you to look at that paper if, if you're interested in this topic. Uh, another way of speeding up um, rendering times is to not work with volume representations and integration, but to actually work with surface integrate, uh, surface representations. So in this case, we have a multi-layer perceptron that implicitly defines a surface its surface is nice because once it's optimized, you can actually extract it using marching cubes and just render it in real time using um, uh, rasterization. And that's something that we explored in this uh, neural lumigraph rendering project that uh, is being presented at CBPR this year. And uh, not only do we achieve real time frame rates, but even for a very small amount of cameras, like in this case, we only have six cameras or so, uh, we can actually get pretty decent results with sharp features uh, that can again be rendered in real time once it's optimized. So in summary, scene representation networks are really different from CNNs and RNNs and other network architectures. So it's a different, it's an active area of research and different network architectures make sense here. Uh, these representations need to be scalable, editable, fast to query, expressive. They have to have well-behaved gradients and they have to be generalizable. So, you know, you can't necessarily achieve all of these traits at once, but Neural rendering techniques like volume rendering and sphere tracing uh, typically don't work in real time. A lot of work has been done recently on making it faster though. And there's some really interesting work that came out earlier this year already on accelerating some of these data structures. These neural scene representations and rendering also have applications well beyond graphics and view synthesis, compression, learning priors, solving inverse problems, and many others. Uh, so this field is just starting out and it's starting to spill over into robotics uh, and many other areas where people are actively looking at, at this type of work. Just want to end with by teasing uh, some of our work that we're presenting here at SIGGRAPH this year uh, on a new architecture that we call ACORN, an adaptive coordinate network that 
is as expressive as siren or more, but that simply trains a lot faster on large scale signals. So here we see a 16 megapixel image of Mars that's fitted to more than 30 dBs in only 30 seconds. Uh, we can use the same framework to fit 3D point clouds really well. For example, uh, this 3D uh, object is fitted to a point cloud and compared to other representation architectures, we get a lot more fidelity and it's actually trained a lot faster too. So this is really exciting. Um, and you know, we're slowly seeing these network-based rep 3D representations being interesting for practical graphics applications uh, because they're just getting to the quality and the runtime that we're hoping they would be. Uh, and so this is just a really exciting area. I uh, hope you stay tuned with uh, some of the other work in this course. Uh, and I'd like to thank my collaborators and students who have done all the hard work in this space, especially Vincent, Eric, Julian, David, Marco, Petter, Alex, Connor, and Jia Jun. Uh, so thanks for your attention and uh, thanks for attending the course. Yeah, okay, thank you. So um, not sure if we have any questions for this talk. Um, so yes, so if you have any questions also feel free to use the chat box.